Africa is taking center stage on digital development with new inventions and innovations. Digital technology is unlocking new pathways, ensuring rapid economic growth, job creations, as well as access to services that didn't exist decades ago. And a group of historians in the East are also on a mission to share untold African stories this via a digital memory site. So Jumbo, Saubona and welcome. I am Dumelo Mutotwane and this is Hashtag Africa. With lockdown restrictions in place in Kenya, a group of doctors and paramedics started a free ambulance service called Wheels for Life that help expectant mothers after dog get to hospital safely. It's night time in Nairobi and a pregnant woman has called for an ambulance. But in Kenya, going into labor after dark can be dangerous. Yes, Kyo, what is the location of your emergency? The country, like many African nations, has no public ambulance service and coffee restrictions have added another barrier for mothers needing to reach hospital. After noticing an increase in deaths and complications, a group of doctors and paramedics started a free ambulance service, Wills for Life. Richard Naumu is a member of the emergency response team. Transport is one of the major factors. So we've had, like I said earlier, 18 deaths, uh, 15 deaths per day because of, because of lack of transport. Uh, so, with this COVID, again, it has increased that rate. Mothers in labor and their babies die more frequently during disease outbreaks on the continent, either through fear of infection in hospital or because drivers are too afraid to take them when police are enforcing restrictions on movement. Early in Kenya's lockdown, police beat a motorbike driver to death after he transported a woman in labor to hospital after curfew. Now patients can call 1196 to connect with a call center where workers ask us if it's an emergency. One such call was from Christine Wanjuru, whose waters broke at midnight. An ambulance arrived in five minutes. I didn't expect that. It was so fast. First of all, the water broke and the baby had a less time. I was so happy. The service has received more than 5,000 calls and delivered around 600 babies. And now Mu says a few grateful parents have named their children after their helpers. Yes, I have two that are named after me. Of course, the first name. <laughs> yes, and uh, it was a consensus. I had to make sure that, you know, both the parents are in agreement because I don't want the mother to name the baby and then the father is on me. The ambulance is on the way. It will be there in uh, seven minutes. Wills for Life is free with the costs covered by public partners and corporate donors. The emergency team now hopes the service can become permanent in order to save more lives. Now, staying within the east part of Africa, a group of British and Kenyan historians from the Museum of British Colonialism are working together to build an online archive of British colonial detention camps in Kenya. You, you spoke very, when Chow Taiyana Minor started researching British colonial detention camps in Kenya, she had no idea her own great-grandmother had been imprisoned in one for seven years. There's a sense of betrayal in the sense that I didn't understand how this was not taught and how this was not something that we, we, we came across as kids, but also we came across in our education system. Tens of thousands are thought to have died in camps set up to jail activists and sympathizers during the Mau Mau uprising of 1952 to 1960. In 2013, Britain made an out-of-court settlement of £20 million to five claimants represented by the Mau Mau Association and a public statement of regret for abuses committed. But the camps remain a traumatic but largely forgotten part of Kenya's past. Now Chow wants to change that. She's one of a group of British and Kenyan historians from the Museum of British Colonialism, who, using documents and field visits, are building an online archive of the period. They also use eyewitness accounts from veterans like Gitu Wakahangeri. I was bitten the whole day until 
I did not feel pain any longer. And then when I was taken back to the camp where I was living, I prayed God, can you let me die so that I cannot go back to that place tomorrow to be beaten the way I was beaten today. For Chow, it's personal as well as professional. Her grandfather, Daniel Sindio, was only 16 when his mother was taken. If anybody collapsed, that's none of your business. If anybody died, they are too bad. But it was a very, very cruel time on the, deta on the detainees. Founded in 2018, the online museum is getting a second lease of life amid global protests against racism. We have um, neglected or silenced certain voices and that the foundations of, of our country or, or, or us as, as a society are incomplete if we do not address certain things. The killing of George Floyd, a 46-year-old black African-American man who was killed in Minneapolis earlier on this year, has inspired a name change on the island of Gori, which is a key port in the transatlantic slave trade. For the authorities of Senegal's Gori Island, the killing of George Floyd was the last straw. The island off the coast of Dakar was a major port in the Atlantic slave trade and is home to the House of Slaves Memorial, visited by Nelson Mandela and several U.S. presidents. At Goree's northern tip is Europe Square. But after Floyd's death in the United States sparked global anti-racism protests, the municipal council decided it should be changed to Freedom and Human Dignity Square. Dudu Dia is president of the Islands Tourism Commission. The city council, together with the authorities and the local residents, started thinking about what Gore Island should represent. What Gore Island should represent on the global stage. The square had been named in 1998 in recognition of European funding for renovations at the UNESCO World Heritage Site. But even then, some felt the name was inappropriate. I think the name Europe Square was, in a way, a symbol of friendship. A symbol of friendship between peoples. But we also said to ourselves courageously that in another sense it is celebrating the persecutor. More than 12 million enslaved Africans are estimated to have been transported to the Americas on European ships between 1514 and 1866, and Gori was one of the main transit points. Today, Dia wants to change the narrative. The world is dominated by emotions such as fear, humiliation and hope. And Gore has to be the door to hope. The fear and humiliation that dominates elsewhere should not be the symbol of Gore as it used to be. Today, Gore has to be a symbol of hope. The symbol de l'espoir. Now, still to come on Hashtag Africa, the Tsumulurong Digital Innovation Present and Witz School of the Arts in Johannesburg has announced that its 2020 Fakugetsi African Digital Innovation Festival will be live online with an empowering Power to the Pixel theme in September of 2020. In its seventh year, this digital-only approach aims to serve a regional African audience. This through a program designed to empower digital creatives to shape the future of digital platforms. Now, the festival invites African digital creatives to tap into its network and to further empower the African industry to not just survive, but to thrive. So we are joined today by Tegan Bristow, Festival Director of Fagugesi. Well, thank you for your time, Tegan. Welcome. Take us through what Fagugesi Festival is all about. So Fagugezi Festival has been going on for quite some time. It's a collaboration between the Tsumulukong Innovation Precinct and also Witz University, specifically the Witz School of Arts. Um, yes, and we focus specifically on developing and supporting digital creatives 
um, African digital creatives. Um, and in that space, we look at gaming, we look at animation, we look at VR, augmented reality, interactive digital arts, digital music, um, and year on year we have different programs to support these. Right, and and during the, the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, I mean, how has been the response to your support to some of the creatives that you work with? So we're basically developing our program in response to this, knowing that um, we're online, and what it means to be online means a lot of visibility. So we're linking in um, special programs that act to make sure that our African digital creatives are seen internationally. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're building our networks of European and American um, festivals and developers. So this year we have two programs, um, one specifically that focuses on digital curators. So people who are bringing together, producing and curating digital art in different ways. Um, and we've got a boot camp program called the Digital Art Curator Bootcamp in which we hope to bring 25 creators from across the continent mm -hmm. to design exhibitions, online exhibitions of digital African work. Right. Why digital? Why digital? Mm. <laughs> digital has been with us for a long time. So we're, you know, digital for us is not new. Uh, Fagugezi has always been digital. And so it's exciting for us to show our talent at this time um, and to show all the amazing animators, VR makers, uh, game makers, uh, digital designers, illustrators who on this continent have been working for so long and now their talents are really needed yeah. um, and really kind of taken into celebration. And, and just through your assessment, I mean, of the continent, do you feel that the content is still playing catch up with the rest of the world when it comes to tapping into or at least leveraging into digital resources? Have we made a few milestones? I think we're far beyond. The amount of talent that exists in Africa is enormous. There are extraordinarily talented makers in the space. I think the only place where we're lacking is understanding what exactly our industry needs to be, how we sell our stories, how we sell our games, um, and who our audiences are. That's one of the things that Fagugezi is really aiming to, to help develop and grow with our creatives. So do we have any set dates as to when you know, the rest of the world can be a part of a global audience uh, for Fagugezi Festival? So we're kind of packaging our program into smaller bits this year. So usually we have like one big 10-day festival that runs in early September. But because we we feel that people are a bit tired um, with all the online content, that we've decided to package it up into smaller sections. And um, our first offering will be available in mid-September and we'll run through to October. Well, thank you so much, Tegan, for talking to us. Thank you. All right, that's Tegan Bristow, the uh, director at uh, Fakugese Festival. Very exciting indeed to see these opportunities coming through for African creatives. But let's come to this now. Network problems will soon be a thing of the past. This we know, of course, Google's uh, parent company, Alphabet Inc., has launched balloons-based internet service to broadcast Wi-Fi signals rather in Kenya, and their transmitters float high in the atmosphere, but are believed to be a world first. This for consumers. President Uhura Kenyatta is getting a video call from a remote part of Kenya's Rift Valley. <laughs> Something made possible by the launch of a world first in commercial internet. In Baringo on Wednesday, Google parent company Alphabet launched high speed internet provided by balloons. balloons. Yes, balloons. Really high flying balloons soaring higher than planes, hoisting powerful transmitters similar to a cell phone tower. It allows people in the remote regions below to get high speed internet through a partnership with Telcom Kenya. The technology has been used before to connect more than 250,000 people in Puerto Rico after a 2017 hurricane. But Kenya's information minister, Joe Mucheru, says this is the first commercial application. We want the rest of Africa to join us, creating a single digital market so that, you know, our 1.3 billion Africans can also all be connected. The balloons are launched from facilities in California and Puerto Rico and use artificial intelligence to navigate flight paths without much human intervention. For residents in Baringo, the long flight of the balloons means they no longer have to trek more than 40 miles to the nearest towns for an internet connection. Dorcas Kipkaroy says she wants to sell her jars of honey to expatriate Kenyans longing for a taste of home. 
This will help me reach out to people even in the diaspora because it has been really hard due to poor network around here. Loon has a deal to roll out the service in Mozambique and Chief Executive Alistair Westgarth says there's been an increased interest from operators and governments after lockdown measures forced people to rely on the internet more heavily. And now in West Africa, numbers are everywhere and for one Senegalese designer, well, she believes that mathematical equations can also be applied in fashion and she's done the math. Equations and fashion may not seem to go hand in hand, but Senegalese designer Diara Busso believes otherwise and she would know because she's done the math. So that flower that we saw earlier can turn into this, to that, just by changing the variables. In this case, it's theta going from 0 to 12 pi. The artist and former Wall Street trader can usually be found exploring mathematical equations and algorithms that will go into the designs of her textiles. At her Silicon Valley studio, Diara turns plot lines and curves into shapes that are then hand-painted based on a colour scheme of her choice. Each shape can be represented by a mathematical equation. And now when you put all these equations together, you can create lots of lots of lots of shapes, which is nothing new. I think the part that makes this different is that when you can actually code it all and generate it with an algorithm, meaning that a process telling the computer, graph this line, graph this equation, find where they intersect, make it blue, do this, do that, do that, now the computer is drawing for you. Ciara claims she's ahead of the curve. She has also developed a digital-first, on-demand production line to avoid creating excess inventory and says she doesn't produce anything unless she has an order. So I think in terms of innovation, this is allowing me to be Quite ahead in terms of um, cost savings, I produce in a fraction of the time and I produce a hundred times more in terms of design ideas. And I like to say ideas because I don't actually print the fabrics until I know I need them. So I'm able to know from a customer preference standpoint, I, I know what customers want because I can generate so many ideas and test them live every single day without having to spend anything on production. And then I can produce what is needed. So from a sustainability standpoint, we don't have wastage. Diara travels between her native Senegal and San Francisco, where she still teaches high school math. That's also where her first flagship store is. 95% of Diara's products are handcrafted in her Dakar workshop, where she employs 15 people. The remaining 5% is made through collaboration with ethical factories around the world. Well, after the break, a viral hashtag on Twitter has potential to become a reality for creatives in Africa. This is Hashtag Africa. Let's now take a quick look at news making headlines across the African continent. A viral hashtag that saw creatives imagine possible African covers for Vogue might soon become a reality. This according to British supermodel Naomi Campbell. In a studio in Lagos, Nigerian photographer Alexander Shimule is working on the front cover for Vogue Africa. At least an unofficial one. An African version of the fashion bible does not currently exist, but that hasn't stopped creatives on the continent from showcasing their interpretations via the Viral Vogue Challenge hashtag. Ashimole says it's a way for African photographers, models, designers, stylists, and makeup artists to show they are good enough to be accepted on a global level. But it would also welcome an official version of the iconic magazine. 
everybody can actually identify with the fact that like they have this high level of quality and excellence that every other person wants to be a part of. So we cannot just dismiss what they've done so far. So definitely, if Vogue Africa would be very important um, and would be very good. But at the same time, we need to start putting more energy into our own platforms and you know making sure that we have you know our, our we, we tell our own stories ourselves. And the dream of an African Vogue could become a reality. British supermodel Naomi Campbell, in an interview on how global anti-racism protests will affect the fashion industry, has said she understands that Vogue's publisher, Condé Nast, is looking at an African edition. When I spoke to many people from Condé Nast, it was always very positive. There was never uh, um, any um, feeling of, no, we don't want. It was just, how do we do it? And is it a re per, re uh, per country or is it, you know, there's 54 countries in our beautiful continent. So how do you do it? We've got Vogue France, Vogue England, Vogue Ukraine, Vogue Russia. So, you know, understandably so, North, East, South and West may want their own. Campbell says the Vogue Africa was being worked on before the killing of George Floyd in the United States which sparked worldwide protests over the treatment of black people. Condé Nast said it does not comment on future business ventures, but continuously works on the expansion of its brands globally. Haditiya Africa is running the second annual Ultimate Story Contest, an opportunity to tell a story worth dollars. Now, 30 finalists around Africa will compete against each other for the title of Ultimate Storyteller. Hadithi means story in Swahili. And the reason we went for that name is because, um, you know, the entire thing says the story of Africa, Hadithia Africa, story oh. of Africa. And Swahili is the most largely spoken language in, um, in Africa. And so we thought it important to recognize it. But as being South African as well, we wanted to send a message that this is not a South African initiative, it's an African initiative. And so the word Hadithi is very well recognized in the East African uh, nations. But if you look at our logo also, it's a variation of an Andikra symbol, which is a, a powerful single symbol from the West African lands, uh, particularly Ghana. And so the, the whole identity of the organization is basically saying, here are a bunch of South Africans recognizing the continent. They see you, see us, let's see each other, and let's create a beautiful story of Africa. So that's what that identity is about. I think for now we've got contacts in about 32 African countries and so we've mes specifically made calls into those countries but um, if you pick up the promotion anywhere and you're in Africa you can absolutely participate. And that's it from me Dumelo Mototwani. Remember to keep the conversation going on Twitter. We are at Africa underscore ENCA. I leave you now with these beautiful pictures from our beautiful continent but until next time goodbye. Thank you.